Welcome. Um, we are FARMS. We are the Foundation for Agricultural and Rural Resources Management and Sustainability. And we exist to help grow farmers. We want to help increase the use of sustainable farming practices in North Dakota, help new farmers launch uh, more small farm and local food businesses, and increase accessibility of local food in North Dakota. And I should introduce us. Uh, Felicity, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Felicity Merritt. I am the program manager for Farms, so I help with all of our educational programming, including uh, this internship and the other webinars, as well as our farm dreams and basically all of our all of our programming. I will have a hand in that. Thank you, Felicity. And I am Stephanie Bloomhagen. I am the executive director for Farms. I've been with the organization since 2018. And I oversee staff, uh, fundraise, uh, and just keep the organization running. If you're here, you probably already know that the health of the soil that we grow food in is one of the key elements of a successful, sustainable farm enterprise. We're here for a discussion on soil health today. We have a sustainable ag internship program where we've had classes with the interns all summer long about various uh, sustainable ag topics. And as the interns have uh, gone back to school for this fall, we're morphing those classes into an every other week lunch and learn for both the interns and the public. We're so glad you joined us today. So in the first half of our hour today, we're going to uh, First, hear a radio interview clip with Derek Lowstutter from Folly Hill Farm and Black Bison Organics. And then we have Derek here himself to talk a little bit more about soil health and answer your questions. Uh, after that, we have Daryl Oswald from Minokin Farm with a presentation on soil health and time for Q&A. If there's time, we have a video clip of a rainfall simulator that they do at Minokin Farm. The video clip is from our uh, 2020 Ag Intern Tour to Minokin Farm and um, discussion on the five soil health principles. So we're going to start with a snippet from Derek Lowstutter's radio interview. He was interviewed by Prairie Public uh, Radio's Main Street program, and this is from August 13th itself as well as the immediate environment. What's your main focus at Folly Hill Farms? Making sure that we get the most out of what we have, especially if it's a relatively low investment in labor. That's the main thing. There's lots of things that you can do, but if it's not a good return on investment for labor, then it doesn't really make sense. There's a lot of growing styles that are out there that are extremely labor intensive and they might give you a good return, but still relative to the amount of work that you're putting into it, it doesn't make sense. So that's why we try to, you know, we try to be as lazy as possible and let, <laughs> and let nature do the, the heavy lifting. A lot of it is bringing on organic matter and additional nutrients that if we're harvesting, but not contributing back to the soil, things will eventually get depleted over time. So we pick up uh, spent grain from local brewery, local grocery stores. We pick up uh, expired produce that isn't fit for human or even animal consumption anymore, compost all that, and we amend our garden beds with, with that organic matter. Okay. Does that mean you have to know that it was raised organically too? Not not necessarily. Um, there is concern when it comes to like hay or manure, whether there's herbicide residue or pesticide residue on that. Um, generally, with uh, with produce, it's clean enough, even if it's not organic. That I don't I don't have a concern putting it in the soil. Certainly, if it's grown organically, then it, it's kind of less anxiety for me. But really, it, anything that I can get, it's, it's just kind of an, trying to increase the organic content of the soil. And you are, already have developed a kind of compost? Yeah. So the sister business for Folly Hill Farm, and really kind of how Folly Hill Farm got started, is a demonstration farm for 
Black Bison Organics, which is a registered organic fertilizer um, that we sell, sell throughout North Dakota as well as online. So what is it about this fertilizer? The idea is that we wanted to do no harm first and foremost, um, because a lot of organic fertilizers, they, they're derived from like blood meal, bone meal, feather meal, from, you know, confinement animal operations, or it's from bat guano or other ingredients that are transported literally thousands of miles. So you might be applying something that says organic, but really is that, is that beneficial o- overall? again, taking a more holistic approach. Because if you're doing harm at the source of where it's being pulled from, you might actually be causing a net net harm rather than benefit. You might grow better tomatoes, but there's a cost associated with that. For Black Bison Organics, we wanted to use local ingredients as much as possible, and it's completely plant and mineral-based. Okay, so you've taken the animal completely out of the equation? Correct. Certainly not opposed to animal agriculture, mm-hmm. but for for the concerns that a lot of our customers have, we wanted to take that component out entirely. So there's not any manure or animal byproducts of any kind in, in our products now. It's just plant and mineral based. So how does it perform compared with some of the things that are out there? There's a lot of uh, familiarity with you know, things like miracle Grow, a lot of the name brand um, synthetic fertilizers. And those work by feeding the plant directly. But unfortunately, when you feed the plant directly, it's kind of like a, like a sugar rush instead of, you know, having a, a full balanced meal. And so you might get really good, vigorous growth, but you're bypassing all those soil microbes and by applying synthetic fertilizers, you can actually decrease the diversity of microbial life in the soil. You're basically taking jobs away from different microbes that might, um, you know, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere or make phosphorus available to plants. There's literally hundreds of, of examples of, of different microbes that have specific roles in the soil, and they're all interconnected. They all talk to each other, and there's an economy of nutrients underground. And so if you're just feeding plants with that synthetic fertilizer, it's just feeding the plant. You're not feeding the soil, and ultimately the health of the soil will decline, and you become reliant on those synthetic fertilizers to maintain the same yield. So if this was the world of investing? Short-term gains would be a, a good way to put it. So really, what, what time scale are you wanting to, to grow for? A lot of gardeners, it's the current season. Um, and then every year they you know, till their garden black and then they, you know, plant the seed or transplant, and then they put down their synthetic fertilizer that they get from a big box store, and that's the way that they've done it. Um, but, yeah, it's not, it's not improving the health of the soil, and eventually you're going to deplete the amount of carbon, uh, which is the organic matter in that soil, by doing that, and you're not going to be contributing to that ecosystem underground. Derek, if you're ready, um, would you like to introduce yourself and your two businesses, Folly Hill Farm and Black Bison Organics? Sure, let me... uh... So yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, My name is Derek Lowstuder. I work currently for the state at the Department of Trust Lands. Um, But then personally, the two businesses that Stephanie mentioned are Folly Hill Farm, which is our actual agricultural um, production business, and then Black Bison Organics, which is the organic fertilizer company um, that we established based on North Dakota-based agricultural and mining byproducts. So we've both businesses have been around for, you know, roughly five years, talking, you know, from concept to the state that it's at now. Um, so we're still certainly developing, but we've kind of, we've kind of hit a stride. Can you tell us what is in your Black Bison Organics fertilizer that makes it beneficial to the soil? 
and it, sure. I'm kind of leading you to talk about biochar. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, so really the number one way to improve any soil is to increase the organic matter. Um, and that's really meaning increasing carbon. Um, and to kind of take a step back, because this is a, a common point of confusion for a lot of people. And even in the, uh, in the interview, um, some portions that, that got edited out, there's some confusion on what organic actually meant. So when we're speaking of organic, there's a few different things that that can mean. You know, on the most basic level, um, and kind of where the other definitions st stem from was like organic chemistry. So it's carbon-based compounds interacting. So that's that's organic. You know, we're talking about like organic compounds. And organic matter is, you know, ba basically something that was previously living or currently living and producing, you know, carbon byproducts, um, rather like through exudates or excrement there's that carbon, that organic chemistry that's getting turned over. And then there's the organic as a, um, you know, like basically um, small O, uh, not capitalized organic, which is a natural systems approach to crop production. And then on top of that, kind of what a lot of people consider organic to be is this big O, you know, capitalized organic, package of practices that are approved by USDA. Um, so that's what a lot of people are familiar with when they talk about organic, but that's only one, you know, really one definition. And really when we're talking about that certified organic, it's, it's about marketing and reaching a, a set minimum for production. So when we're talking about organic matter in soil, what we're really talking about is again, that organic chemistry, that carbon that's being turned over. And so in our Black Bison Organic products, we want to provide both stable and decomposable carbon because the decomposable carbon will contribute to, the, um, to that soil ecology, um, that activity in the soil, whereas the stable carbon will provide benefits longer term through you know, water retention, um, nutrient retention, a number of benefits. I know that your uh, black bison organics fertilizer includes biochar. What is that and how does it benefit soil? So biochar is, again, there's kind of a few definitions of biochar depending upon who you talk to. And it's often, you know, what they're trying to sell you. Um, but at its most basic level, I define biochar as pyrolytic carbon. So it's organic matter that's pyrolyzed, meaning it's um, a thermochemical reaction where the organic matter, <clears throat> all the volatiles are driven off and you're left with just carbon or as close to just carbon as you can get. So it's, it's heating organic matter up in the absence of oxygen. So it's not combusting, but you're turning it into char. So it's, it's basically really, really clean charcoal. Um, is the way that it acts and um, and looks. So biochar is that that carbon, and this is something that's been used for millennia, intentionally and unintentionally. Um, you know, I was reading a paper that uh, about 50% of the organic carbon in Iowa soils is biochar, and that's from um, frequent grass fires, you know, coming through prior to European settlement. Um, so those grass fires, it would create a flame up top, but the lower levels, it would exclude the oxygen. So that heat from, from higher up in the grass canopy would pyrolyze that carbon lower down. And, and it, it's, you can kind of think of it as turning it into a carbon fossil. Um, so it looks, um, you know, if there's not as much disturbance when it's happening, it can look exactly the same. So if you pyrolyze, um, you know, a corn cob. Um, it'll look like a black corn cob, but it'll be completely different, um, you know, chemically from, you know, a corn cob, corn cob that hasn't been pyrolyzed. So, so biochar, the main reason why we're interested in adding it to the soil is because it's improving that, um, that organic um, matter over depending upon how the soil is being managed, it can be stable for 
uh, seasons, if not millennia. You know, we're, we're seeing um, some soils that have been uh, used with high uh, pyrolytic carbon contents. They've been used for, for centuries, you know, without a decrease in um, infertility or um, issues with soil structure. So the biochar adds long lasting carbon to the soil, helps conserve water because you're increasing porosity, um, helps prevent, prevent nutrient loss, both um, uh, physically, you know, that pore space holding onto the nutrients, and then also chemically, it actually does bond with the nutrients, yet makes them available to plants when needed. It buffers soil pH. And depending upon what you want to do uh, with soil pH or fertility, lots of different things, you can have different char. Um, pyrolyzed a different way or made from different feedstocks. Like, you know, you can get biochar that's actually chicken manure um, or um, biochar, you know, what we sell, it's, um, it's beetle killed pine trees. And those are going to have different properties, both on soil pH and nutrients and all that. Um, biochar also promotes healthy soil microbial life um, through a number of ways. Uh, it's kind of like a you know, room and board situation for a lot of soil microbes. So the the pores, um, macro and micro pores in the biochar, it's housing for those microbes. You know, retaining the moisture and the and the uh, the nutrients. It's it's food. And then also we're learning about um, electric electrically, um, kind of how these signals are sent throughout the soil. So it's it's you know all the utilities that uh, microbes could want in kind of little carbon condo. And that's the main benefit of, of biochar. And that's kind of a, a, a deeper level because when you're, usually when you're trying to apply biochar initially, you want to improve the porosity and that uh, water and nutrient will be faster. And then also another benefit, which is kind of shown in its use and reclamation of mine lands and things like that is finding toxic uh, elements in soil, um, both uh, chem chemically, um, those toxic uh, compounds uh, being bound up with the biochar, so it, it they're still there, they're still in the soil, but it you know changes the way that they would interact with other um, life forms in the soil, um, or it helps plants deal with um, stressors such as toxic compounds in the soil. So that was that's kind of the you know five minute rant of what what biochar can do, but there's literal you know, multiple week uh, workshops on on just biochar and soil. So it's it's uh, it's quite the rabbit hole. Wow, thank you, Derek, and uh, thank you for your uh, succinct explanation of the of the different definitions of organic earlier as well. That was very helpful. I would like to know what questions uh, those in the audience have brought um, after after all that Derek. There was a lot in what Derek just said, and I bet. Um, you're curious about some different aspects. You can you can unmute yourself, uh, you can raise your hand, or you can put it in the chat and we can call on you. I just have a kind of a thing that's running through my mind, I guess, Derek. So I'm translating this through my own schema and wondering if biochar and like how you use activated charcoal as a human being, if there if, mm -hmm. is that kind of on the same same concept where it's it's really binding to those things that are um, bad for the soil, just like it's binding to the things for, for people that are um, unhealthy for them when they use activated charcoal. Same same thing or kind of on the same same way. Yeah, yeah. Ex excellent question. Um, yeah, really exactly the same way. So it's that that porosity uh, in in sure. the activated carbon. So when we're talking about activated carbon. Um, a lot of that is is actually coal based, um, unless it's it's actually marketed as being you know plant based uh, activated carbon. So they they have you know this um, this carbon that they somehow clear the pores out of, and then that's what you you would take um, as as a supplement, and it binds with the toxins again chemically as well as physically you know absorbing them, but you know, a lot of people have issue with that saying, you know, if you, if you're absorbing all of this, you know, if you're absorbing good things, for example, nutrients out of the soil, um, and you're absorbing these bad things out of the soil, um, then how, how is that a good thing for plants? Because, you know, you're, you're taking the bad stuff out, 
but you're also taking the good stuff out of the soil. And um, I mean, plants are, are selective, um, or I should say the fungi that associate with plant roots are selective. Um, so they can kind of go after um, good and leave the bad um, or kind of encapsulate those, um, those compounds that they view as toxic. Um, so there's certainly things that can still get taken up by plants in biochar amended soil, but uh, generally we see a, a reduced impact there. But yeah, you, you hit it right on the nose. Thanks for that. That really puts things into perspective for me. So you, uh, you talk about how like this biochar increases the porosity and the holds the moisture in the soil. Can you like, what other, like, what if I, you know, I, we talk about compost or just cover crops or leaving, um, stuff on the surface. What is the difference that biochar does on the soil level? Like, why does it help hold moisture better? Or is it just another way to do a similar thing? Yeah, yeah, thanks Felicity. Um, really, there and any organic matter is good, you know, as long as it's, you know, relatively clean, you're not adding, adding stuff you don't want into the soil through the addition of organic matter. Um, so when you're adding compost, um, the assumption with compost is that it's broken down somewhat, but it's still going to decompose over time. And so compost is excellent. Um, you know, pr it provides nutrients as well as the food for microbes, because that's really what it is. The, in order for the plants to make use of all that, it needs to be broken down by the microbes. Whereas um, biochar is not decomposable through microbial action. Um, so you, there might be some tars or kind of this organic film um, that's very reactive that uh, develops on biochar, but the biochar itself is not broken down. Um, so that's the, that's the main difference with compost. Um, it's great. For, for multiple reasons, but it only lasts, you know, a few seasons. Um, whereas um, with biochar, it's not so much a fertilizer in and of itself, unless you charge it with nutrients before applying it, but it is, it's kind of a battery um, in the soil that is charged up um, by what's in the soil. And then uh, the plants and the fungi are able to tap into that battery as they need it. So does that, does that kind of answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? Derek, this is Daryl Oswald. Yeah, hey, Daryl. How are you? G great to hear from you. Uh, very Likewise. interesting. Uh, the biochar thing is, it's, well, it's a bit perplexing for us here at the Minokan farm yet, but uh, we see it as having some merit. But we were told or something was said about you know, limiting the amount of biochar, we've added it to our compost. We've put it on some of our fields. And, uh, but we were very careful to, to regulate the amount. Do you know anything further? I mean, is that a wise decision or can we just add, and this is information for the group. So that's why I'm asking the question. Uh, is there a limit of biochar that, or more of a more standard measurement that we can add to some of our practices? Yeah, great question, Daryl. And, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of research that's been done on biochar has found out that um, biochar can have a neutral or even a negative impact that's, um, that it's added to. And it all comes down to um, the characteristics of the char that's being applied, you know, whether it is a true, you know, high carbon, you know, like above 90% uh, biochar, if it's kind of like a dirtier cooking charcoal that has still a lot of uh, volatile compounds in it, um, uh, you know, polyaromatic uh, hydrocarbons that can actually be toxic. Um, but if you have a, you know, a high temperature, high quality biochar, um, that can reduce the potential impacts. Um, or the other issue that's often the case with those negative impacts is that it's applied 
way too much uh, at once. And, and it's not, and it's applied raw. Uh, you'll see out there that say, you know, you should never apply biochar raw. And um, a lot of, if you add too much of this biochar at once, it just throws the, the ecosystem out of whack completely. You know, it completely disrupts that, that economy of microbes and, uh, and plant roots underground. So the, the soil has to kind of reestablish itself, you know, find a new equilibrium. And so if you're, you know, with biochar, slow and steady uh, is the best way to do it. And especially if you can uh, find, you know, value added opportunities to, um, you know, and like feed, uh, feed a little bit, you know, eat less than 2% feed to the livestock and that can improve feed conversion and uh, improve overall animal health. And again, that kind of charges the, the biochar or, you know, um, stormwater runoff. There's lots of different ways that we can use biochar uh, as a primary use. And then the secondary use is actually application to soil. But yeah, there are, there are certainly situations where you don't want to over apply uh, biochar and you're doing exactly the right thing by, by being cautious. Okay, well, that's right. And slow and steady wins the race. Yep. Uh, we have one question from the Facebook uh, live stream, and it is, how can you make biochar? And I would also add to that um, the difference between making biochar and just burning something. <laughs> I think it's an right. important distinction. Right. Um, so again, uh, pyrolysis is a thermochemical reaction in the absence of oxygen. So if there's a flame, you know, if you're burning something, then that implies that there's oxygen. Um, and so that, that, you know, one, you're losing carbon to the going to happen, but also your, your, um, you know, the resulting char isn't going to be as high quality. Um, and so, yeah, you don't want to just, you know, burn stuff. There are low, you know, low cost methods of producing biochar yourself, um, including just like a conservation burn pile, you kind of pile stuff up and then you keep a flame burning up top, which excludes oxygen from lower down. And, you know, you're, you're not going to get as good uh, out from that um, than like a commercial system, but, you know, you have a lot less invested. So if you go online, um, you know, there's lots of different methods for making biochar again you know it is kind of a rabbit hole and 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 some some places you need to kind of take it with a grain of salt um because in a lot of cases people are just trying to uh sell you something um whether it's the system or the biochar itself so you know we've we've kind of done our due due diligence excuse me due diligence on finding good um source for biochar um, and so we, we make a, a small amount of biochar for ourselves on our property. We have an arborist that drops off some cuttings and then we make biochar from that. But the bulk of the biochar that we use and sell comes, comes actually from Colorado. Again, from beetle killed pine trees that, you know, it's uh, helping the rural economy through cutting down these already dead trees. It's helping for, uh, forest ecology and then you know, the, the kilns that are used to produce it, it's a very high uh, output relative to the feedstock. So, you know, we've kind of done that math and that's what works best for us. And honestly, that's what I recommend. Um, you know, there's a lot of places that they kind of support the, you know, home, home production of biochar. And you can make good biochar at home with, with materials that might be freely available to you, you just need to make sure that the characteristics of the resulting char are something that's going to help your soil and not, um, not kind of cause any issues down the road. Because any, you know, any biochar that's made uh, in a less controlled environment, there's probably going to be less, or, uh, there's going to be less carbon, more ash, and that ash is mineral content, which, you know, can improve soil fertility, but it can also significantly increase your soil pH. So if you're gonna be using char, if you're gonna be making char to apply to soils, you wanna have a good idea of the characteristics of the char before you kinda of go, go overboard on it. 
Well, uh, thank you, Derek. It's 12.36 and um, we, we should probably move on to Daryl's presentation, but do you have any last comments, uh, Derek, before you uh, close? We also have, uh, so I think Derek mentioned Minokan Farm once or twice, um, and we have Daryl Oswald here, uh, who I will let you introduce yourself, Daryl, and uh, state your position at Minokan Farm. And uh, Farms just took uh, our 2021 interns down to Minokan Farm just a couple weeks ago for a tour and we learned so much about soil health there. There's a lot to learn there. So uh, Daryl, um, if you'd like to share your screen and your Certainly. presentation, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Certainly, and thank you, Stephanie, for the opportunity to, to be with you uh, all this afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone. and. Uh, Thank you so much for visiting. Uh, I believe it's been about two weeks now, hasn't it? The time flies here at the farm uh, for bringing your group in and uh, coming to see the, the Minokan farm. I got hooked up with Felicity this morning, uh, real late. Uh, I have to apologize. I, uh, Jay had given me a little uh, heads up yesterday and I ran out of time, but uh, it's all good and uh, I'm glad to be here with you today. So uh, uh, Daryl Oswald is uh, who I am uh, and uh, I am the manager of the Minokan farm. And of course we are a conservation demonstration farm. And uh, I have been managing it since 2016. I've worked for the Burley district since uh, 1999. Uh, I also happen to be a farmer and a rancher uh, northeast of here, about 25 miles, right east of Wing. Uh, so uh, we have a ranch there, farm and a ranch, and uh, we employ a lot of the principles, uh, same principles that we do here at the Minokan Farm, and and uh, very fortunate to have that opportunity and this opportunity. So uh, I, I tell everyone I'm uh, really fortunate and and blessed to, to get to do what I what I do uh, here. So uh, really enjoy it. But uh, this is a, a short presentation. I actually spoke to uh, maybe some of you are familiar with the Quivira group uh, earlier uh, last winter. And uh, it, it just gives a quick overview of uh, the Minokan farm and uh, and now that's, of course, that sign has become synonymous uh, with uh, soil health, as Stephanie talked about. And what do we do here at the Minokan Farm? And Stephanie started out her presentation today and I, or her, her intro, and I wrote this down, is the health of the soil is key to sustainable ag production. And, and really, without having a lot of time today, we could sit and, and discuss that uh, entirely, but that is the key. And then of course, the Minokan farm was the brainchild of the board of supervisors and, and Jay Fear, who many of you know, our former district conservationist and the lead educational component here. And that again, uh, they knew that the health of the soil was key to this being sustainable. And when you look at our ag production model today, obviously uh, there's some uh, concerns. And of course we use the five soil health principles. And, and of course, Stephanie brought them up as well. And when you talk soil health, of course, the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And uh, we base everything that we do uh, on the five soil health principles out here on the soil. And for those of you that attended uh, a couple of weeks ago, what you've seen <clears throat> in our soil demonstrations and when you went to our fields is the difference between 
soils that have had soil health principles applied to them and those that have not. And I believe, you know, we make mention that our soils are very different. Uh, they're the same soil, but their management is very different. Uh, we show a, a bit of extreme, but those who are gardeners, farmers, ranchers, uh, their soil is somewhere in between. And of course, uh, how far you go down the soil health road is depending on how many of these type principles that you employ. And <clears throat> one of the things too that came to my mind as I was sitting here, when you talk about the soil health principles, really you're replacing management, the management of the soil and what you're doing replaces the inputs. And, and Derek made mention of synthetic fertilizer and, and the things uh, that producers, gardeners, uh, orchards, all those type, <clears throat> excuse me, producers employ. And of course they're using synthetic inputs generally. And with, by employing the soil health principles, you're using the management and uh, that, that's how you generally proceed. And I just wanted to go through the, the soil health principles <clears throat> very quickly. They're, they're basic, but they are vital to the necessity of, of what goes on. And Andre, and I quote him always a lot, but <clears throat> the reason why armor is the number one is because obviously you have to have the soil be covered and there's different ways to achieve the armor as you can see and most of the carbon in the dead litter goes into the atmosphere is carbon dioxide we know this green plants give us an inlet for carbon going into the soil and and derek mentioned a lot about carbon and which is essentially the the organic matter the minimizing soil disturbance, obviously, if you've got microbes and you've got living soil and you've got lots of stuff going on in there, physical disturbance especially is destructive. And it really doesn't matter uh, the, the manner of it. Uh, if you recall some of our demos that we do here, we talk about removing pore spaces and compressing the soil. If we were going to build a road, that is what would, we would like to do. If we want to grow a crop or a garden of vegetables or an orchard, those are the type of things that we don't want to do. And we talk about water infiltration and air movement. Of course, this year, uh, earlier and up to about a week ago, obviously we were very limited on water and and different areas across the state. And so the little water that we did receive, we really want to try to infiltrate that. And of course, a healthy soil allows us to do that. And when we, we till or disturb the soil, uh, obviously we remove any soil armor and it releases a burst of carbon dioxide, which really gets down to the heart of why we till. And we've had this discussion before, and, and this is an interesting comparison. And we also talk about fracking an oil well. Why do we frack an oil well is the same reason why we would till, because we get maximum release, right? Maximum burst of carbon, maximum production. And of course, eventually this, leads to, while well, it does, not eventually, it results in carbon loss, which isn't sustainable. And I, Derek did a great job of make mention of this as well, that obviously if you're putting more carbon back into the system than you're taking out, you're going to be sustainable. If you're not, uh, you're, you're not sustainable. And, and I recently thought about this and I run this by some some people and I'll visit with you a little bit about it today and you may have questions. 
I also equate tillage and fracking and somewhat, what's the term I'm looking for, somewhat related as being fire, because we also talk about grazing land and, and uh, we use fire as a tool sometimes to limit invasives and, and to do things like that. But we also get a huge burst of carbon uh, release. And then that obviously results in our, in our green up. Uh, plant diversity is huge. Uh, you, the big thing to know is there is four crop types and we want to try to um, uh, utilize all four if we can. We have the small, uh, excuse me, warm and cool season broadleaves and uh, the warm and cool season grasses. And uh, high carbon plants obviously build soils because you're bringing additional carbon into the soil profile. And of course it builds soil resiliency of which was mentioned earlier. You're building organic matter uh, putting more carbon into the soil. So the amount and quality of carbon from crop residue contributes to the amount of soil carbon. This is a particular picture is a, a field of ours at home on the ranch. These are my two daughters in a cover, a multi-species cover crop field that we did graze with cattle. Uh, and that's actually African cabbage, which is the, the yellow flower that you see. So Again, you want continually growing living plants in the soil as long as possible. This is proven that, of course, our soils were built with perennials with a huge root mass. Unfortunately, we farm with annuals with a much smaller root mass, and that goes back to the statement what I just talked about, about putting carbon back into the system rather than taking it out. Uh, nature is a constant feed process, right? Uh, it constantly needs to, to be fed. And of course, we constantly build soil aggregates. For those of you that were here uh, and have toured the Minokan farm, uh, building aggregates is a continual thing. They generally uh, need to be renewed and plants generally grow them about the first four to eight weeks of their pro. Uh, of their uh, growing. And of course, cover crops can fill in what otherwise would be a fallow period. And the only way to build soil aggregates, of course, is to have a green growing plant. This is a very important one. Uh, one of my favorites, of course, uh, and one that's often overlooked when you look in our large scale production model. Uh, livestock integration obviously has been taken out and we talk a lot here at the Minokan farm about simplifying the landscape right and and also I had a discussion this morning an interesting conversation with an individual that is coming out to tour the farm in about a month and she's associated with a large-scale production agriculture and started to talk about the simplification of the landscape, which I turned the conversation towards then. And this is something to discuss as well as this being the human aspect of production. And of course, as humans, we like to simplify things, at least I do. And of course, simplifying the landscape is generally not uh, not a, uh, a good thing when we're dealing and trying to build soils. And, but it also is a very human aspect of what goes on because we want, we want to do that. Animals, plants, and soils uh, have played a, a role, a, a syn synergistic role since the beginning of time. You can balance the carbon to nitrogen ratio using livestock. Uh, you can manage our crop rotation residue for no-till seeding. Uh, this particular photo is actually taken out here at the Minokan farm. And uh, this is uh, some of our yearling 
uh, heifers uh, grazing in one of our cover crops. Obviously that wasn't this year, I believe it was last year. So, and again, going back to kind of the uh, theme for the day, livestock create the opportunity for more, even more soil carbon. In the farm economy, the currency is carbon. Uh, these are some of the things that we need to consider. It is the most important but most overlooked aspect of all plant nutrients. It's the main food for soil biology. You cannot increase soil organic matter, and I think Derek stated this, without an excess of soil carbon. Carbon is uh, a currency because it can be collected, it can be spent, it can be saved. And of course it is desired by all soil organisms. And unfortunately in today's production model, we tend to misuse carbon. These are factors that affect the loss it's in gains of organic matter, these are well documented. This is from the nature and properties of soils from Brady and Weil. And of course, the factors on the left tend to lean more towards the five soil health principles, which we have discussed. The factors on the right, of course, lend itself more to some of our current production model practices. And so uh, those are some things to consider. The soil organic matter is the house the microbes live in. Uh, there is a picture of a healthy soil, obviously, with uh, aggregates, porosity, and worms. And uh, this is what we should be trying to, to move our system toward. Uh, and albeit it, it's always achievable, uh, we can make the porous soil, and we know that now, into the best soil. And I always like to leave uh, people with a positive note because it is achievable and uh, the journey uh, is a good one and uh, it certainly can be done. So any questions for the group? Do you have a recommended place to start for someone who is interested in uh, starting to build the soil health of their soil back up, but maybe doesn't want to take the full plunge yet? Sure. So again, armor is one of the, or is listed as the first soil health principle because it it's the starting point, right? You can't build soil health. You can't be regenerative if you have wind and water erosion, those type scenarios occurring. So armor is important. I like to think the next one is the disturbance. So if we can minimize or eliminate the disturbance, we have the armor on there. Those should be your starting points. And the good news is, is, is again, we've seen a lot of people take these initial steps. Of, of no-till, uh, whether it's in gardening, uh, whether it's uh, in, in a larger production scale. And so when you look at Burley County, and, and this is somewhat regressed as of late, and this is directly related generally to, to uh, commodity prices, but you know we're about 75% no-till in Burley County. And of course, that's not the case in some other places. And but there's a good percentage of people that are doing those. And so when you move down the soil health road, uh, those two things, the armor and the disturbance are a good starting point. And, and you have to do what you're comfortable with because that it, it comes back into the human aspect that I talk about. So if I'm a, like a home gardener and I wanna take the first step armor, and let's say, okay, I actually do. I have a, a brand new raised garden bed out there yeah. just filled with, with black dirt and some compost. So what would be the best armor I could put on there? Like grass clippings or straw or? Obviously that's all good things. Uh, 
a green growing plant this time of year is nice. Uh, we're, we're taking five fields of our, of our larger demonstration fields. They're about 12 to 14 acres each. Uh, we're actually going to start seeding rye on them next week, winter annual rye. And if you recall in our high tunnel scenario and in our outdoor uh, garden scenario, uh, we will be seeding winter annual rye in those as well. And of course, there you're, you, you've got a green growing plant. Uh, it's going to stay in the game per se, as long as mother nature allows it this fall. And then of course it will uh, regress for the winter. And then in the spring it comes up and, and starts green and growing again. And then you can look at terminating that particular plant and then seeding your vegetable, your uh, crop, whatever you choose directly into that residue. So uh, I, I really like winter annual winter rye for that. Uh, it works well. Jay has proven it time and time again in our high tunnel uh, and it's been successful in that regard. Any other questions or even comments? I'm curious to hear what others are doing for soil health on their own farms. Okay, uh, Judy said, thank you for hosting this presentation. Her Wi-Fi is sketchy today, but she was able to catch most of it and really appreciated hearing more soil tips from Daryl and expanding her understanding of biochar. And you met Judy uh, at our farm tour a few weeks ago. Well, it is one o'clock. So uh, I really appreciate your speaking with us today, Daryl. And My pleasure. Thank you, Stephanie. Great to visit with you guys again, and obviously always come back and see us. Uh, it's uh, we we certainly enjoy working with the farms organization. So, well, likewise, <laughs> thank you, thank you all for joining us today for this discussion. Go ahead, Felicity. I know we're over time, but I just saw another question in the Facebook chat. So, really quickly, do you have any knowledge, Daryl, on adding? mushroom mycelium to cover crops? I don't. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just touch briefly on some of the bio inoculant that we use. Some of our technicians that are interested in that have made mention of the mushroom mycelium. Mm -hmm. I, I really can't speak to that and, and give you a comfortable answer, but uh, I didn't really touch on the bio inoculants uh, today uh, that we use, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I could really extend the, <laughs> the discussion, but uh, I, 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 we're seeing some positive things. And, and so when we use our bioinoculants, we're, we're adding uh, the mycorrhizal fungi, uh, which only occurs in a green growing plant. And uh, so I believe it, it's somewhat related to that scenario. I probably... I may have taken it what was meant to be a joke seriously, but I thought uh, Jay said something about adding uh, mycorrhiza to the high tunnel beds in like right. a bird form. <clears throat> right. Again, you can only get mycorrhizal uh, fungi from a green growing plant. And so the, the, the worm juice for the lack of a better term, or the bioinoculant that comes <clears throat> from those vermiculture beds has none in it. And so when we add it and add it as a additive or a, uh, a liquid on our fields, we actually have a product that we enhance it with, with, with the mycorrhizal fungi. And so <clears throat> if you recall, when we had the analysis done, down at the DNA lab in, uh, I think it's Sweetwater, Texas. We had 300 different species of bio, uh, bacteria and fungi in there. Uh, but, you know, it's the mycorrhizal fungi that is really the key component where you, uh, the transfer occurs uh, between the soil microbes. And, and obviously uh, it gets back to the cover crops and you need a green growing plant to have that connection. Okay, well, I would love to stay all day talking about this. 
and our tour at Minokin Farm did last about five yeah. or six hours, uh, which is what it takes to cover all of the good stuff about soil health. So thanks again, Daryl. Yep, and, thank you. Uh, if anybody has questions, just reach out. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Right. Yeah, thanks. Click the end button now. So have a great day.